you're here today. Um, I'm, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, people are moving up from Sunday school right now and Bible studies, and then we've got our children meeting upstairs on the top floor, and just lots of things going on today. So thankful for all of you that helped out or donated with sheltering day yesterday. I'm going to show some pictures a little bit later on during worship today so that you can uh, get a hold of what's going on there and you can kind of experience that. But if you donated or if you volunteered time or was there to give things away, thank you very much for helping out. I'm so excited to tell you that we have reached our Annie Armstrong Easter goal. Yeah, isn't that awesome? We didn't just reach it. We, 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 we took it out over the top. Where was it? It's on the back of my bulletin somewhere. There it is. Our goal was $3,800, and we took in $4,745. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to stop giving. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean that you have to stop giving. That just means that we've reached our goal. And all of those funds that we get for Annie Armstrong go directly to helping out uh, our church plants, our missionaries, our directors of missions, and our local associations that are working in North Carolina. Um, and then I'm supposed to say, did you know that we have a gospel concert tonight? <laughs> Everybody say yes. Okay, yeah, great. We're, we're, we're connecting together. Um, tonight at 5 o'clock, we're going to have an outdoor gospel concert. You're invited to come. You can bring your lawn chair. We're going to be, instead of facing the building like we did during Easter, we're going to be facing the picnic shelter, and there'll be some people there to help you out. Calvary's Hill will be joining us, and we will be taking up a love offering for that. So we just want to have, we wanted to have some dedicated time where we could all get together, whether we were inside or outside, and feel really comfortable seeing one another. So I want to encourage you to be there, encourage you to bring your family to be a part of that. So um, welcome to worship. God bless you. Everyone is invited to praise the Lord because of what he has done and who he is. And even if you are young, you get to pray to God too. We're all invited to pray to God. And sometimes it's hard to know what to say. And so I always like to think of a little way to help guide my prayers this is called the Axe Way, which maybe some of you learned in GAs back in the day like me. So we are going to spend time adoring God, and then we're going to confess things that we've done, knowing that we're forgiven. Then we're going to offer God specific words of thanksgiving. We're going to tell God, thank you for our mom and dad and all the things we can think of. And then last is a fancy word, supplication. Can you guys say supplication? Yeah. It's a fancy word that just means ask God for what you need, and he'll give it to you, or not, but you have to ask. So let's go ahead and pray using this method. Let's pray together. God, hear our words of praise and adoration. God, you are so big and good and kind and humble compassionate. God, you are truly amazing and transcendent and awe-inspiring. God, now we give you our words of confession, things that we've maybe done wrong this week. God, we confess that we have not always loved our neighbors well. We've not always spoken kindly. We've looked over people. Maybe we've even told lies or done harmful things. God, we confess all of those to you right now. Thank you so much for forgiving us. You always forgive us, Lord. Thank you so much. And God, we want to lift up even more words of thanksgiving. Hear now all of the things we're thankful for. God, thank you for our families. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this beautiful spring. Thank you for this challenging year and hopefully bringing it to a close, God, this, this opening up for keeping us safe during those times. And yet, God, we also know that people were hurting during these times. So now we offer you our our prayers of supplication. God, hear what we need. God, many people need healing. Many people need hope. 
need comfort. God, please help us to be the light in the world that you've called us to be. And help us be your hands and feet in this county. Help heal us as well, Lord. God, it's only because of the relationship that we have through Jesus Christ and your, and your spirit that we are able to pray to you. And we thank you so much for this wonderful relationship. And it's in Jesus' name that we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. Good Amen. Job, guys. Man, I'm so thankful to see you guys. Today. I hope that you have had a wonderful morning already as, as we have dedicated this day to the Lord, been praying for our times, whether they're in Bible study or whether they're in worship. Now, as she's sneaking out the door, man, I should have started with this. As she's sneaking out the door, of course, we thank Miss Crystal uh, as she leads our uh, uh, children's church time upstairs and for her adult leaders that are just right there with her. And for all those children, can we just say a blessing to them? Heavenly Father, bless them as they go. Bless them as they do church in their own way, in a way that they can learn and grow. Thank you guys very much for your leadership there. Uh, if you have your Bibles with me, I encourage you to open them with me to uh, Matthew chapter 17. To be fair. Um, I do some some sermon scheduling. We do worship scheduling. We try to do it like a long way off. That way, I try not. I try to keep the surprises down for Kathy and Bill and Kate as much as possible. Uh, but um, a few a few weeks ago, the Lord kind of changed the direction, and and so I've been waiting on pause for about a month to bring up something the Lord interrupted everything else with. And that's what we're going to start talking about now out of Matthew chapter 17. And that's the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Um, and that's a big theological word that talks about is changing in a moment. And there was a specific moment where a changing occurred. And we're going to describe that and come as it comes. But, but to be fair, I'm only going to talk about verse 1 today. But we're going to read the whole thing. All right. Before we get into that, though, I want to show you an illustration of something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and that is rock climbing. That's a new one for you guys, isn't it? As a young man, I um, just, this was, this could have consumed my world really quickly. Um, I, I was into climbing walls and rocks. I'm not talking like, like as a tomboy, how we used to, to climb the magnolia trees. You know what I'm talking about? Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like hundreds of feet up in the air. And, and today you look at me and say, but Daniel, you're scared of flying. How can you do that? I'm with you. All right. Things change. I changed. This is um, a rock in um, uh, South uh, Arizona, excuse me, and it's called the Prowl, P-R-O-W-L. This is a, a, a rock that's perfect for climbing. It's about 80 meters. And I know that looks like it's millions and millions of miles uh, up off the ground there, but it's really not. So, that, you know, it's about three or 400 feet off the ground, okay? But to be fair, 300, 300 or 400 feet a lot, okay? Climbing up the side of this mountain. Um, wonderful. And so they say that this is an easy mountain to climb um, or easy, you know, thing to traverse up compared to so many others like, I don't know, Mount Everest, okay? But this one's fairly easy. A few hours worth of climbing and you go from the bottom to the top. Let's, let's show the next picture, please. So that's me on the side. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's not me. Oh, you know, that, you know that's, this is climbing up the side. Um, and and uh, there is a slogan. Like there, there are some rock climbing websites. Like you can get on these rock climbing websites and mountain climbing websites. And they'll, they'll give you some descriptions, some geography, some, some easiest ways to, to climb up a side or something like that. But the title for this one is incredible. All right, so the title on one of the rock climbing websites for climbing this one is always invited, rarely climbed. Always invited, rarely climbed. I mean, and I, I know many of us are not going to try to traverse up the side of this thing like this person does. And, and we might think this is the craziest thing in the world to go climbing up a mountain. But I believe that today that God has a mountain that he's inviting us and I pray that we will hear the invitation and accept it. I pray that today we will not 
be one of those rarely climbed days in our lives. But that we will hear the invitation and accept it. Now, to be fair, there's a reason why this one's called Always Invited, Rarely Climbed. And that's because at the base of this little uh, rock that they climbed up is actually farmland. And the owner that owns the farmland owns the, the mountain. Okay, And so he owns the mountain as well. And so in order to get permission to go climb this, you have to get an invitation from the owner to come onto the land and climb up the mountain. And today I want Christ to send us that same invitation. Brothers and sisters, it's time to come up the mountain. Will we accept the invitation from the owner? So let's read through Matthew chapter 17, the first 13 verses after six days. Say six days with me. Great job. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brothers, uh, and the, excuse me, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will, shut, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Say that with me. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified, but Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has appeared from the dead. The disciples asked him, when then, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah come." comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wish in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then, this, then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. I mean, God bless this over the next several weeks before us. Now, I'm not going to keep you here several weeks straight. Wink. Okay, we're just going to look at verse one together today. All right. Verse one, verse one, six days, six days. Jesus took uh, with him Peter, James and John, the brothers, uh, the the brother of James and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And we're just going to focus on that passage. I believe in order to get a good grip on this passage, that we really need to scroll your eyes up a little bit to what happens uh, at the end of chapter 16. Now, there's some parallels in this in Luke. Um, And in Luke, Jesus has just fed the thousands. You remember two loaves, some fish, some bread. You get the idea. Miraculous event occurs. And then and then Jesus um, uh, gives this great question out. uh, Who do you say I am in verse 15 of chapter 16? And Simon gives that confession. You are the Messiah, the saving one, the son of the living God. Okay, so. Great setup. Peter's on a roll here. He does a really good job. And then, and then in verse 21, Jesus starts to predict that he will be crucified for the salvation of sin, for us to redeem us. Okay? And this is new language for the disciples. Okay? Remember, Messiah in Jewish thought is supposed to be victorious king. You know, he's supposed to come riding in with chariots and horses, supposed to come, you know. You know, as that king that restores Israel. But, but, new language. Jesus here says he's going to die. He has a purpose in that dying. And in that same conversation, the same Peter, the same Peter that, excuse me, that calls him the Messiah, who gives that great declaration, then starts to argue with him. Because Peter knows best. Remember that TV show? Yeah. Well, here it's Peter knows best. And Peter starts telling Jesus, no, that's not the plan. That's not the plan. Then look at chapter 16, verse 24 with me just for a moment. 
And Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. They must take up their cross and follow me. I mean, again, new language for the disciples. Now disciple means follow and follow means in some way that I need to exchange or give my life over and pick up the life that Jesus is describing, the life that's going to take him to, the, to, the, to death for on our behalf. You know, that's brand new language and that's so difficult. I mean, to be fair, if your greatest hero told you that his pathway his pathway for heroics was going to be to sacrifice himself. You would struggle with that. But to be fair, you would walk through the next several days of your life doubting. Well, I thought that he was going to be a victorious king and he's telling me he's about to die. And I don't know if he's all that king that I built him up to be. Start questioning. Start wandering. For the disciples, it was wondering for how long? Six days. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life that just super burdened? Not a little burden. I'm talking about one of those where you didn't know exactly what was going to happen next. You know, that generally brings up anxiety and frustration for us. Can't get it out of our mind. We're worried, we're worried, we're worried for days. Sometimes longer than six days. But in the middle of that wandering and questioning, just my just powerful stuff in this passage. It wasn't the disciples that came back to Jesus. It was the Jesus who went to the disciples. In the middle of their questioning, in the middle of their doubting, it wasn't like the disciples came back to Jesus and said, we agree with the plan. Okay, this is awesome. We're going to go down this pathway. No. In the middle of their struggle, Jesus shows up six days later. And I hope that for some of us today, it's the sixth day. And some of us know that wondering and struggling. Some of us have trouble. We get the idea. We understand doubting and questioning. But today may be your sixth day for the invitation by Jesus Christ to come with Him. I pray that for some of us, for the church today, that today would be the sixth day. We would rise up together and accept the invitation of Jesus Christ. I told you I would show you some pictures um, about a sheltering day. And this is, the, the, this is a few of those pictures that Matthew is going to put up there for us. Um, I, I, you know, to be fair, I did not go around and count everybody. I just saw that when we started that on top of all of those picnic tables, things were stacked up. You know, like like to the second and third level. Tell you, you know, dishes and clothes and everything that you guys volunteered. A, a whole section of furniture in the back. And and there's this little table over here next to the right um, that has our breakfast gourmet meal being served. It is the same meal that we have served every year. We have hot dogs. Praise the Lord. We give them away for free. Everything out here is for free. I think Freddie and, and the guys who were cooking and Daryl and Alice, and they told me that they, they cooked 130, 140 hot dogs. We just gave them away. Ran out, if I remember correctly, or close to it. And then, uh, let, me, let me see the next picture up there. See them cooking. Aren't they doing a great job? Now, nothing like a good grilled hot dog in the morning. Just, I mean, really, like they've tried out here to give away you know, sausage biscuits. It doesn't go as well as good old hot dogs. The next picture, Matthew, I mean, you just see the, the rows of people. And then there's our church members who are serving and helping out, putting clothes out, having people pack stuff up, taking things to people's houses, loading vehicles up with all the stuff that they got to get for free over and over and over again. I mean, we, we, there's no restraints on this. We, wanna, we, we just want people to come and to take the next picture, please, Matthew. And here's Donald, one of our heroes for today. Don had and Don had with some with me. Don and I had just a simple task. All we wanted to do was 
hand out tracts and invite people about to, excuse me, to come and join our, our church or excuse me, to come be a part of worship with us. We invited everybody that we could. Everybody, we had a conversation. We were looking around to see who had not gotten a tract yet or who had not gotten a pamphlet yet. And we are talking to them about what Jesus Christ means to us and how we think that everybody should accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior so that they can go to heaven. Amen? I mean, that's what we're doing over and over again. We gave out maybe 100 tracts. All right, we had, they're coming packs of 24, and they're in the back, right back over there. You can get some on the way out, okay? But through this conversation of the 100 that we handed out, you know, uh, Donald and I are talking later, we had three people reject it. Now, I don't know their names. I mean, we weren't tracking that part for, for who was rejecting. All I'm saying is that we went to people and said, hey, can we invite you to our church and just sh- sh- give you a book that tells you a little bit about Jesus Christ? That's literally what we were saying. And some people said no. How tragic is that? And, and today, and today, so let me apply that for that was yesterday. Let me apply that for us today. How tragic it would be if, if Christ today is inviting us to come with us in the middle of our heartache, in the middle of our pain, and we said no. But today we could say yes. So we could say, I'm coming. I'm, I'm, I don't know what this is going to look like. Uh, you know, it might be straining for me. And, and I understand that you just told me it might require my life. But I'm coming with you. I'm coming with you. And Jesus, on occasion, gives us a special invitation to a unique encounter that's different from other ones. It's not, it's not every time that we're invited up the mountain. Although we wish it happened every day, don't we? There's an occasion here in Matthew chapter 17 where some are invited for a special occasion to get a unique glimpse of Jesus Christ that would change their lives. Today, let's say the same yes to that same invitation. Jesus took with him three disciples. Peter, James, and John. Now, uh, to be fair, Peter's the one that always sticks out in my mind because maybe because I'm a little bit more like Peter and, and Peter just got finished sticking his foot into his mouth. Just got through correcting the Son of God and telling him that was not the plan. He was not going to die. And six days later, Jesus comes to him. I mean, that reminds me every single time that it's not about qualifications. It's not about how good you are. It's not about what you bring to the table. It's about the invitation and calling of Jesus Christ. Jesus meets them in their doubting and he invites three. So what we get here is a picture of one of my favorite things. Disciple making 101. Jesus comes and gets how many? Three. Good job. Jesus comes and invites three to have a special meeting on the mountain. Just three. Now, he could have invited everybody, true, but today he's inviting three. Others get to have different encounters, but today he's inviting three. Of these three, these three are become, going to one day become the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. If you, uh, uh, excuse me, of these three, the, the, I mean, these are the three, the only three that get to see Jesus transfigured. Uh, the, the, these are the three, the only three that saw Jesus Raise a girl up from the dead. These are the three. The, the only three. Who accompanied, who accompanied Jesus Christ a little bit further. In the garden of Gethsemane. Not because they deserved it. But because God can take anyone. And do something. It's not because they were the best. It was totally into the invitation. Of God. And what what really stands out to me about this is that Jesus, the model of how we should be living our lives and doing even church, shows us in a very simple way how we can be a part of this process as well. Disciple making. Disciples invite other people to join the journey. I'm headed up the mountain. Who's going to come with me? I know that seems a little bit um, exaggerated, But that is the same opportunity that we get to have today. 
Please listen up, church. Please listen up, brothers and sisters. This is our chief role that we might find two or three, not because they deserve it, but because they need a special and unique encounter with Jesus Christ. And we, we, we invite them. That's our best effort. Invite them to come up the mountain as we're going up the mountain. And imagine the life change that gets to happen because we invite some people to have a unique encounter with Jesus Christ. So Peter invites, excuse me, Jesus invites these three disciples. They get to go up the mountain. It reminds me of, of a buddy of mine named Eddie Embry. Man, I love that name. It just kind of rolls off your tongue, doesn't it? Eddie Embry. Double E. We just called him Eddie, though. I used to work at a camp and, and uh, as, a, as a young man going from uh, uh, excuse me, high school to college. And I went to a college that was on the quarter system. Were any of you on the quarter system in college? Uh, well, thank you. Just a few of us. Man, it was the best system in the world. I mean, for 10 weeks, you could take as many classes as you wanted to. And then you get to flip it over 10 weeks after that. I mean, it wasn't 16 weeks. It was only 10. Praise the Lord. But since my college that I went to was on the quarter system, that means that I didn't have to show up to school until like well after Labor Day. Like everybody else is going to school like the first, second, third week of August. Like a month later, I, I just get, I'm just getting started packing up to go to college. And so all of my college buddies had gone off to college and I still work at this camp for several, excuse me, for several more weeks. And so I was invited by the leader of the maintenance group, Eddie Embry, to come and work with him for the next month, repairing things, putting things back in order after a summer of camp. Eddie was a very godly man. Um, he, he loved the Lord, leader in his church. And so every day, Eddie and I would go work on projects, painting, fixing, and he would talk to me all along the way about who Jesus Christ was in his life. And I would share with him my young man frustrations. He would share with me who Jesus Christ was in his life. And one phrase I just remember that he said stuck out, stuck out to me to this day. That if we would just, just learn to walk with Jesus, we would be able to celebrate how he orders our life. If we would just learn to walk with Jesus, then we would be able to celebrate how he orders our life. Now, Eddie was the guy, one of the guys in my life who invited me up the mountain with him. Who are we inviting up the mountain with us? Today, brothers and sisters, as you are disciples of Jesus Christ, charged to be disciple makers, would you follow this, this little plan that Jesus has and find somebody to invite with you up the mountain? It could be the highest thing that we do this week. The highest thing. Now I've alluded to my third point all the way in. All the way in. And, and that is the end of verse 1. Up, up a high mountain by themselves. Most likely and historically this is Mount Hermon which... Uh, unlike the Prowl Mountain that I showed you earlier, Mount, Mount Hermon is you know between nine and ten thousand feet above sea level. I mean, just just a big mountain. And I don't know how far they were going to the very top or to a ledge or where they were going, but Jesus invited them up that mountain. You know, we all need mountaintop experiences with Jesus Christ, don't we? I am so thankful. I mean, this is what sticks out to me about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. But he's still today inviting us up the mountain. For you, for me, today he's still inviting, saying, I have a special and unique experience that I want to have with you. And he's inviting us up that same mountain. Now, to be fair, disclaimer, we can't live on top of the mountain. Life happens in the valleys. But what happens on the mountain fuels our faith so that it can be, de be demonstrated in the valleys. And what happens over the next several verses of this passage on the mountaintop will change these disciples' lives. 
We all need mountaintop experiences. And today Christ is inviting us to join Him for another one. And maybe that mountaintop experience for you is, is making disciples that make disciples. Maybe today it's just surrendering the questions and doubts to the God of the mountaintop. I have a buddy of mine that I graduated high school with who had a unique family background. His faith of his family was not Baptist, Protestant, or, or even Christian. And my, to be fair, he's two years older than I am. And, and this, young, this, this young man at the time really had heard about Christ but didn't have a personal relationship, understood what church was because he was buddies with me and my brother. Anyways, one day my older brother started to invite him to come to youth group and come to church with him. Changed his life, got saved, witnessed to his family. I mean, it was just awesome. But I remember one summer we were all sitting around just you know, sharing one of those summertime student ministry experiences where we had been on a mission project and we felt like our lives were changed and we'd been to the mountaintop. You know what I'm talking about? One of those special and unique encounters with God. And, and my buddy just sat out loud in the middle of that group and circle of five or six of us just chatting about what God was doing. How I mean, just as teenagers, how we felt like God was doing something unique in our lives. And out of all of us, this guy just said, it's all he said, just what he said. I'm just so glad I was invited because now my life has changed forever. And I'll tell you, my buddy's life was changed forever. Not just because of that experience, but because somebody took time to invite him to come up on the mountain. Now, for some of us, this is going to hit us two or three ways. Number one, you may be the one that you, you're just begging, please, I need that mountaintop experience. I need that today. I pray that today for you is that sixth day. And you hear clearly because... Jesus is still inviting us up the mountain. He's still giving those experiences away that change our lives. And today could be ours if we would just do the hard part. Chapter 16, verse 24. Give our lives over to Him. Fully. But, but maybe this is, this is refreshing because I want to let you know it's not about our our, our, our ability, He's just still inviting. But maybe this hits us the other way. And you as a believer realize just today, I've never, I've never invited somebody to come up the mountain with me. Or it's been so long that I don't remember what that's like. It may look scary, but trust me, the Jesus that invites us on the mountain empowers us to invite others to come with us. Look, church, Maybe this is the largest point of revival that we can have today. Because everybody's looking to us right now. What are we going to do after this season of our life? I don't know. But I do know one thing. Jesus is still inviting people up the mountain. So can we. So can we today. Share that hope with others. But it may just be for us as a church. A wonderful reminder. A wonderful heart. that We're going to hang our hat on. That just like Jesus, we want to invite people up the mountain as a church. That's where we're going to put our efforts. So we're going to put our goals. Where's your commitment today, brothers and sisters? What, what, what answer are we giving to God's call? It might be, absolutely, Lord, I need that mountaintop experience. It might be, dear Lord, I commit to inviting somebody to come up with me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you still invite us up the mountain. I thank you that today that we've heard your call. So for those of us who, who need that call, Father, Holy Spirit, go out in such a way to still invite us in these up the mountain. And Father, for those of us who, who need to join your disciple making work. Father, you would encourage us and we would feel that commitment, and that call to change the world and lives of those around us by inviting them up the mountain to see Jesus. And I pray this in His holy and most precious name. Amen.